there's no reason to believe right. that if you just tell the truth, it's right. going to put order into the world, right. right? There's no logical reason. You tell the truth. Yeah. Jesus Christ told the truth. Didn't work out. You know, yeah. you know like yeah. you tell the truth, they're yeah. going to do awful things to you. That's how the system, unfortunately, operates. Yeah. But the, the very notion of telling the truth is better than the alternative. Doesn't mean good things are going to happen, but it's better than the alternative. That's a leap of faith. What a, yeah, what a, what a, what a freaking yeah. incredible way of looking at faith. Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. Dave Rubin, welcome to the What Is Money Show. It's good to be with you. Let's talk about some stuff. Let's talk about some stuff. <laughs> uh, for starters, we are in London at the inaugural ARC event. Uh, you are a man that's quite close to Mr. Peterson, having opened for him for many years, yeah. uh, done some business businesses together as well. Um, just by way of quick introduction, you are the host of The Rubin Report. You're also the author of two books. One is Don't Burn This Book, <laughs> Thinking for Yourself in an Age of Unreason. <laughs> and the second book is Don't Burn This Country, Surviving and Thriving in Our Woke Dystopia. Um, and you can probably figure out what the third book will be. If you just look at the extension, <laughs> Don't Burn This Book, Don't Burn This Country, you can sort of figure out where the next one will be. I must not be bright enough to figure out the next one. Planet, world, something, uh, something okay. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're running out of, oh, yeah. <laughs> running out of okay. runway there. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. You're making big leaps. Yeah. All right, book the country to the world. Got yeah. Um, okay. Obviously, I mean, this is implied in the titles of your book, right? Don't burn this book. Was it yeah. uh, Fahrenheit? Night. What's the book? Fair 451. Fahrenheit yeah. 451, right? The temperature at which a book burns. Yeah. In which they were burning books, right? And, um, so the, the title of your book implies the importance of free speech. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm assuming you did that on purpose. It was intentional, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, that would Hell lead, of a coincidence. That would yeah. lead me to believe, yeah. and based on what I know about your work, you are a strong believer in free speech. Um, could we start by getting you to define what free speech means to you? Sure. And when did you become concerned that it was under attack? In recent years yeah well it's interesting because i come from mostly a lefty background i, I grew up in new york in a, in a largely liberal family now it, unfortunately these words are always constantly changing now and when you're in england and you say liberal it means a little something than america when you say liberal also the word liberal across the board has really been hijacked by yes. leftism 
the idea of liberalism, and my first book really is a, is a full defense of classical liberalism. Mm. Classical liberalism is, the, is basically the idea of individual rights, laissez-faire economics, limited government, logic and reason, law and order. Mm. And, and basically, that if you take those concepts, you can then build a society from the bottom up, that, mm. that you, the individual, are the root of everything. And to connect that to free speech, it's your ability to think and reason and logic and make arguments for yourself mm -hmm. that are the, the very foundations that allow a civilization to flourish. Mm -hmm. That's very upside down from what sort of modern liberalism, which again is a, a butchering of the word liberalism, progressivism is sort of like, we is the basic idea that we need this structure above us mm -hmm. that will tell us what to think, that mm -hmm. will tell us what's acceptable, that will give us very, very narrow pathways mm -hmm. that we can use to think and reason. And if you step outside of those things, you're a bigot and a racist mm -hmm. and everything else. So when I say that I grew up in a liberal household, I mean it in the, in the truest sense of liberalism, in the sense of uh, John F. Kennedy Jr., who was mm -hmm. a liberal, Ask not what you can do for your country. Ask, uh, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. That's the reverse of what a liberal would say now, right? If, right, if, right, if right, oh, right. again, a quote unquote liberal, if Bernie Sanders walked on a stage and said that, he would be lynched yes. because his whole motive and the motive of the progressive left now is the idea that the state will give you some stuff. Yes. What they don't tell you is they're going to have to take a bunch of stuff That's right. from some other people, yes. you know, usually those scary billionaires. And yes. it's like, you can take all the billionaires' money and you're still not going to fix any of these problems. But what really woke me up to the to the free speech component of this was that everything that I just laid out there, those were the things I was talking about. I was yes. just saying, hey, liberals, you know, we should debate ideas. We should be able to agree to disagree. And what I found consistently was there was a set of people that were on the, the liberal side that were calling everybody Nazis and everybody mm -hmm. bigots and homophobes and now transphobes and mm -hmm. everything else. And I thought, well, this is this is very bizarre. The, the people that I thought were my people, the liberals, seemed to be the ones doing this. And then oddly, what I found was when I sat down with conservatives who I largely disagreed with on a bunch of stuff, yeah. I've I've shifted, I'd say, in some ways more, mm -hmm. more to the center and a little more conservative, which usually people do as they get older. What I found was it was conservatives who were usually defending the ideas of liberalism. Mm -hmm. And that was a really mm -hmm. bizarre notion, right? It was conservatives who were standing up for individual rights. Right and conservatives who were defending free speech. It was conservatives who were being silenced at college campuses mm -hmm. by liberals. Mm -hmm. So to specifically answer your question, the, the idea of free speech is that you have a mind, you have an ability to, to use logic and reason. It's the thing that separates us from the animals. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's basically yeah. it. And you should be able to say what you want in the privacy of your own home, in the public sphere, and you should not be jailed or imprisoned for it with with extremely and now i would do this from an american perspective we're mm -hmm. here in england they don't have the first amendment mm -hmm. but from an american perspective with extremely extremely uh narrow uh narrow ways of precluding that mm -hmm. yelling fire in a crowded theater with the intent to do harm right calling directly for violence etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. but beyond that you can say what you want now the yeah. one i'll just add one other thing which is the confusion around that seems to be these days that if you say something and then someone says something back to you that you've suddenly your your free speech has been infringed upon. But the negotiation of free speech is that I will say what I think, mm -hmm. you will say what you think, and if those things are different, uh, you're you're allowed to counter my yes. free speech. What you're not allowed to do in a, in a civil society is shout me down, is make sure that I don't have access to speech, make sure if, right. you know, someone's invited to a college campus, this happened to Jordan and I many times over yeah. the years, that, you know, there would be protesters who would be trying to stop us from speaking. Right. Uh, that's an infringement on free speech. But yeah. beyond that, you have the right to say what you want in a free society and really the foundational idea of a free society. Yes. No, brilliantly, brilliantly said. Um, I think it was Peterson, I actually put the same question to him when he was on the show, and he said something to the effect of free speech exists so that we are individually able to pursue truth. Right? Yeah. And so this idea that we are the, the rational animal, right, we're the animal that's imbued with rationality, logic, thought, speech, the ability to communicate. Um, I forget who said this, but... Uh, the purpose of free speech is so that our ideas can go to battle and die so that our bodies don't have to. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it is that, right? It's, we have this rational means of dispute resolution, conflict resolution that is nonviolent that allows us to be the civilized animal. Yeah. 
And when you take that away, right, and you can take this away in a lot of ways. Right? Things devolve pretty quickly. Right, destroying the definitions of words, right? Liberal meant low to no government, right? Like individual is yeah. the cornerstone of the state. Today in the U.S., it means the exact opposite. Yeah. So it's like you're, you're, you undermine rational discourse when you, when you dissolve or invert definitions like that. And when that free speech option is taken away, we're left with nothing but raw physical power to yeah. resolve our disputes. And that's why it's been such a damn shame watching the liberals lead this movement. Yeah. And I think there's actually a reason for that, which is that liberalism, as Jordan would put it, you know, we all have a hierarchy of needs and uh -huh. order uh, and wants and things that are important to us. And liberals, by and large, put tolerance at the top of that, at mm -hmm. the apex of that. But tolerance... Tolerance, of course, is a virtue. You want to be tolerant of people who think differently and who yes. come from different traditions in different places. But tolerance shouldn't be the, the apex of the hierarchy because right. then, in essence, you're saying, welcome to my home, everyone, all the time. We have no rules, no nothing here. We have no door, no gate. Yes. And, right. and then, unfortunately, the bad actors, the, the barbarians, yes. uh, will be at the gate and you will have removed the gate right. and let everyone in. And that really... You have to give the give credit to the progressive movement, as as deranged as I think it is, and as as now I think it's become truly dangerous, especially mm -hmm. with the events over the last few weeks. Um, you have to give credit that they saw the soft underbelly of liberalism. They yeah. saw the tolerance of of quote unquote good liberals, and they just went at it. Yeah. They infected the system. Uh, actually, in my last book, the way I write about it is, I'm sure you've seen the all the Alien movies, the original Alien movie with yeah. Sigourney Weaver, 1977. Yes. Um, you know, there's a great scene towards the end where the, the doctor is the robot on the ship. Yeah. And, you know, the alien has basically killed everybody on the ship. Yeah. And Sigourney's talking to the doctor and he admires the alien. Mm -hmm. And she can't, she doesn't understand why. Mm -hmm. And he's, well, he says, well, this, this creature, this thing, it does what it wants to do. It's mm -hmm. merciless. It's remorseless. Mm -hmm. It's a whatever it is. I don't like what it's accomplishing. Mm -hmm. It's killing everybody here. And, you know, the guy's got goo le leaking out of him. Yeah. But but he admires it for doing whatever it set out to do. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's where we have to. It's not that you're crediting what the progressives have done because you right. like what they've done, but you have to acknowledge they they saw something in liberalism which is a good thing, right. and they used it against itself. And, and we're seeing that now, especially in the last few weeks with a lot of the protests we're seeing, we're seeing liberal societies not know how to defend themselves right. in, the, in the face of something extremely, extremely dangerous. You don't have to credit them for that, but you have to acknowledge right. that in, in a... In a effectiveness. Yeah, you have to acknowledge it. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. So let's talk about that a little bit. Tolerance. I, don't, I would interpret the classical liberal ideology as being more about respect for private property. Mm -hmm. right? like, and you brought up this is the common uh, almost cliche example at this point of the, the place where freedom of speech doesn't work right shouting fire in a crowded theater yeah now with the intent to do harm which is a part that people always forget because right. you actually can if you were a comedian you could say to everybody oh, fire, it's yell right. fire yeah. and, and of course you could do that but it's the intent which is inter it's yes. an interesting little caveat that people yes. forget yeah and very hard to surmise often yeah just the intent um I, Rothbard, Murray Rothbard, yep. he said that actually you, it's all about who owns the theater, mm -hmm. right? And did they authorize people to shout fire in that theater? So presumably if I own the theater and I hire you as a comedian to come in, I'm authorizing you to say whatever you want when you're on stage. Right. right? So you can get up there and yell fire all you want. It doesn't right. really matter. Right. Uh, people probably aren't going to storm out because you're a comedian. Like there's other little yeah. subtleties there. There'd be other reasons that they'd storm out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it is is tolerance part of the classical liberal ideology, or is it more this idea that people own themselves, they own the product of their labor, private property is uh, the the foundational institution of, of classical liberal ideology? I get I I'm not sure what the word tolerance means. Yeah, because I would say a classical liberal is like, well, yeah, they're tolerant. Like you you have a right to life, liberty, and property, as do I. But yeah. if you infringe on my property, I'm not tolerant of that. Right. right? So you have to figure out where that line is. And the, the, yes. the example of whether it boils down to the owner of the theater yeah. saying anyone is welcome in here to say whatever they want at whatever cost yeah. is, is an interesting distinction between what the government should say about something right. like that. So I would argue, and I think this would fully be, well, this certainly would be within the laws of the United States, but I also think it would be within the classically liberal tradition, 
that actually, if you were to walk into a theater, so there's someone performing at the theater and you run in the back and you scream, there's a fire in the front, the chaos with the intent of doing harm. So the chaos that you could cause, in, which would damage people's yeah. life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness yes. and, and all of that. Um, actually would be an infringement on, well, it would be an infringement on the owner's property rights yeah. and uh, and we just laid out why it could be an infringement on somebody's life and everything else. It yeah. a stampede sure. trying to get out of there. So in, in a certain case, I would actually lean more to the public good than if, mm. the, than if the owner of the place said, yes, everyone can come in here, scream, yes, you can scream, behead the Jews yeah. and whatever you want. Right, then, right. then I think you've traversed into other territory. Right. But that, little space that we're talking about right there yeah. because we've whittled this into a right. pretty narrow little spot that's what the west is struggling with right yeah now. because when you see the day before i arrived in london when you see a hundred thousand people chanting palestine should be free from the river to the sea everyone knows that's a coded call for genocide they know what the river is and what the sea is right, right? right, right. and so they are saying it should, what you, by free yeah. that means no jews there so they are they are implicitly doing that and they're doing it very cleverly, by the way, which which is also why I would say you have to give the devil his due here. You have to give yeah. these people credit. They know they can't walk out there and be like, kill all the Jews, right? right. Like it would be too obvious. And then actually there would be British authorities probably mm -hmm. looking into deportations and a whole bunch more. So they're using the freedoms of the West against itself. And we've seen this across college campuses now and everywhere. And so, again, that little thing that we're talking about, it's now becoming the most important right. place to figure this out. Because yeah. if we don't figure that out... Uh, if we don't figure that out, we will be at basically civilizational collapse, which in, which in some respect, the West, and I would say Western Europe, is really, might be heading towards no matter what. Yeah. I think the United States, we have some better protections. Australia, let's say, because of geography, probably has some better protections, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, so we need free speech to prevent us from devolving into animalistic, violent relations, yeah. right? That's the kind of the superpower of being human. But, and so the one exception to free speech, it sounds like, is when you have direct uh, calls to violence. I, I would say that direct. reminds the purpose of free speech. Direct calls to violence. And then, again, from an American perspective, we have extremely, extremely very rarely used laws related to libel and slander that right, are almost right, never, right, right. that are so freaking tight. They're almost impossible. And by the way, I think that's good. Yes, as, as bad as our mainstream media is and for all the times yeah. that they quite literally put me yes. and Murray Rothbard and Jordan Peterson and Thomas Sowell on the front page of the New York Times calling us the leaders of the alt-right, mm -hmm. they actually do have a right to do that, I suppose. They're probably... I spoke, sure. to, I spoke to some First Amendment lawyers when that happened. This mm -hmm. is a couple of years ago, literally saying that we were leading the alt-right with pictures of all of us. And I spoke to some First Amendment lawyers because I was really curious, like, what, what really are the limits there? And basically, the, the three or four people who were like, you know, top experts in this yeah. field who deal with these types of cases, they said you would that it probably is an infringement because you're probably within that libel and slander mm -hmm. portion of this. But A, you will get tied up in lawsuits forever. Right. The New York Times has a hell of a lot of money. Yeah. And and by the way, the recourse on that is almost nothing. The you know what I mean? Damages is not much. Right? It, it's, it's not going to be much. Yeah. And really, what do you win in the end? Yeah. So again... I would always veer on the side of more speech. Uh, yes. It does not mean that they will get pretty damn close to all of those, whether it's from the river to the sea or whether it's yeah. taking a, a decent, you know, psychology professor from Canada and t saying that he's basically the most racist person on earth. Right. Uh, I would veer on the side of allowing a little bit more of that as, as horrible and, uh, and annoying yeah. as it is. The river to the sea example is interesting too, because there's some plausible deniability built in. Well, that's right? the, that's the trick. So it's that's like, the great trick. They're not stupid, right? Again, yeah, you can say sure. what you want about these people. They might be misguided. I think a huge per, uh, percentage of the people out there don't understand the history of the land and, and all of that, yeah. which is a separate conversation altogether. But they're not stupid. Sure. They, they are organized. You know, the, the fact that BLM basically became a Hamas organization overnight, the mm -hmm. same people who were protesting for BLM, who, by the way, never did anything mm -hmm. for black people, the BLM, right, which, right, BLM, right, which right. made hundreds of millions of dollars, right. did they send one black kid to college? Right. Did they start any no. black businesses, any of those things? They did nothing. Yeah. But the fact that they unmasked it overnight to now have the same foot soldiers, yeah. the same pawns out there, yeah. uh, they are very clever. And, and they use that coded language. And, and again, until we really figure out what to do with that, um, we, have, we have a major problem on our hands. 
major problem. That's a very difficult. I don't understand how the rule of law can preserve free speech and also try to punish certain lang- like language tricks. Right? So that, Where the, you can call for violence without calling for violence. Right. Where does the law actually intervene properly in that situation? No. Well, this is where, again, from an American perspective, constitutional lawyers, will, yeah. this is like the great fight that constitutional yeah. lawyers are going to have. Um, because we have better protections in the United States, there's probably a little bit more that the state could do here in Europe to, to silence some of these people. Yeah. Or I, so one thing, for example, that you could do, and we're doing this in Florida, where I live, by the way, and DeSantis, I think, has been phenomenal on this. You know, he banned certain protests at colleges because they were not because of speech, but because they were giving material support to Hamas, meaning they were mm-hmm. using these rallies as fundraisers for Hamas. Now, mm-hmm. Hamas is a recognized okay. terrorist organization. So he's not saying you can't go out there and, and yell about the Palestinian right. cause or something like that. Yeah, but sure. once it's financial, once there's other ties to it, now we're not talking about speech anymore. Yeah. So I think that's how the, the West is going to have to level up and figure out ways that, okay, you want to do everything possible, as noxious as the speech might be, to yeah. allow these people to express themselves. You know, I would say there's also one other piece here that's a little bit tricky, which is that, so if you saw the 100 or 200,000 people chanting these things here in in Britain, well, let's say you were a British Jew. Well, now they're getting very, very dangerously close. I mean, they're intentionally marching through Jewish areas. They're going outside Jewish restaurants. Again, these are not Israeli places Mm -hmm. specifically. They often, they pretend to make these distinctions, Mm -hmm. but they don't. But you're also veering towards mob rule related to a, a, a people that are part of your society, that are legal members of your society. So, yes, this is extremely messy right now, yeah. and we're, we're going to have to figure this out. It is very complicated. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it seems so simple in theory, right? Let anyone say whatever they want. Yeah. But again, when you look at it, it's like, the means of preventing violence when the speech starts to induce or encourage violence things get very murky very quickly right well look at it this way if, if you if you and they've done this they'll they'll stand outside a jewish you know a jewish owned cafe screaming all of these things well now there might be a property rights law so mm-hmm. this is where i think when you when you referenced that before this is where we do have some of the protections to to do things right one of the things that DeSantis did about six months ago in florida and it, it happens to be very nice relative to what's going on now. He passed a whole bunch of property right laws that we didn't have. So, for example, you can't stand outside a place of worship, be it a temple or a mosque or a church, and use, uh, you know, uh, digital images on the side of a temple to say, you know, I hate all Jews or mm-hmm. the outside a mosque, kick out the Muslims or something mm-hmm. like that. Now, you might say that's an infringement on free speech. But no, you can say all of those things. Right. But you can't, not but, it's, but not on their property. Yes. You can't walk up to a home of a person every day yes. and put flyers in their mailbox right. that say, you know, you don't right. belong right. in this community or something. So there's ways, and I think this is a much better way of dealing with speech. Yes. There are ways to pass laws related to property yes. and, and related to public goods. You know, yes. what you could say at, say, a public university versus a private right. university that will offer much better protection. Again, it's not going to be perfect, but yeah, but that's probably the better way of dealing with it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then the public goods, the public property, is still going to be problematic, right? Because yeah. It's, well, which majority is deciding who gets to say what? When. Right. It's, it's it's easier when it's private property, right? It's because easier when it's private property. But look, if you if again if you go back to the last few days, there were these massive protests. They walk all you know all through London on all mm-hmm. these routes, and they seem to do it uh, mostly on the weekends. Mm-hmm. Let's just say you were completely, ap- let's say you owned a freaking sneaker store. Yeah. You're completely apolitical. You're not religious. You're just, yeah. well, if every Saturday, you know, your store in effect is closed mm-hmm. now because there is a massive rally outside, whether you like it or don't like it. Well, now you've just taken one day of your ability right. to earn yeah. has been removed. Right. So at some point, the state does have a duty to protect you as someone that is a legal citizen who yeah. is creating something. And again, that, so it's like, all right, well, what are we going to do? Can you protest only in public parks? And then or should the parks just endlessly be taken over by protests so no one can enjoy taking their kids to the park? Mm-hmm. These are these are major c- civilizational issues that yes. we have to figure out. Yeah. Yes. Wow. That sounds like it could be a rabbit hole yeah. conversation. If you are a business owner or manager, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, and 1. 
36,000 is the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, which allows you to streamline accounting, financial management, human resources, and more. NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days rather than weeks, and to drive down cost. And finally, one, because your business is one of a kind. So with NetSuite, you get a customized solution for all your key performance indicators in one efficient system with one source of truth. NetSuite is everything you need all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash whatismoney. That's netsuite.com slash whatismoney to get your free KPI checklist. Again, netsuite.com slash whatismoney. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technologies. iCoin has released a free software update for all existing wallet holders that includes a secure messaging feature called Chamber. With the Chamber upgrade, you can send text messages with all the security benefits of a cold device. With wallet-to-wallet -wallet encrypted messaging, there is zero chance of a message being decrypted by a snooping third party. Chamber's encrypted messages can only be created and read on an iCoin wallet, which means messages are never seen in plain text on a hot device. You can use any messaging platform to send Chamber encrypted messages. Even if the messaging channel is compromised, your messages will remain uncrackable. You can now generate and store your message encryption keys on a cold device. This means you become the central authority and your encryption keys are never seen on a network connected device or kept in cloud storage by a third party. So why not protect your private communications like you protect your Bitcoin private keys? Pick up a few iCoin chambers today for friends, family, and coworkers. With the iCoin Chamber, your privacy is built right in. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Okay, you've interviewed a lot of people on your show, uh, had a lot of really good conversations. Is there anyone in particular that you haven't interviewed yet that's on your interviewee List. I'm going to give you one that's either the most cliche. This will I'll learn a lot about you in one second right now. This is either going to be the most cliche thing I can say, or you're going to find it to be the coolest thing I can say, uh, which is George Lucas. George I, I would, Lucas. Yeah, okay. I would love okay. to interview George Lucas. Star Wars, putting aside the last three that were horrible, yeah. and basically everything post Disney that they've destroyed. Well, did he oh, participate in the last? No, okay. no. So they yeah. had him around, sort of consulting for the first one of yeah. the new ones, yeah. Force Awakens. And then I think he actually stepped away. You know, J.J. Yeah. Abrams ended up directing it. Right, right. But George actually, to his credit, didn't want to be on the set feeling like he was influencing it. So, I mean, right. which is quite a mark of a man who yes. could create lore that captured imaginations of generations of people. Like, you know, really yeah. like the stories of our time. Yes. And that he had the opportunity to still put his imprint and said, no, I'm going to I'm going to hand it to this Absolutely. guy. Absolutely. And to his credit, I think J.J. did a fine job with the first one. But. The rest of it and subsequently everything Disney has done with Star Wars and, and yeah. a lot of the properties that they've taken has destroyed it. But but George Lucas, not only because Star Wars was, when I saw it, it did capture my imagination. Yes. It created yeah. a world that was important to me that the stories, you know, as we're here at our conference where Jordan and, and so many people are talking about stories, yes. the importance of stories. If you watch the, the original trilogy, the, the story, the redemption story, mm -hmm. the child and the son, the father coming back again. These are true eternal stories. That yeah. that's the beauty of good science fiction. It's the right. beauty of, of whether you like Lord of the Rings or you like The Matrix or or, or yes. whatever you like, yes. right? The beauty of a good story is that it's telling you something true and you don't even realize it because right. you're like, oh, look at the magic, look at the robots, look at the yes. all the other stuff. Uh, but the reason I'd like to interview George Lucas is because relative to everything we've just talked about, in terms of free speech, in terms of governments gaining too much power and handing away those liberal traditions to authoritarians. I'm, I'm on the short list of people that will say this, but the prequels, the three prequels yeah. that, that get kind of crapped yeah, on yeah. by everybody. If Jar Jar you, Binks and all that. Jar Jar, and Jar Jar was not a good character, and okay, fine, and yeah. oh, the accent and all that. But the story, you know, people think the story of Star Wars is just the story really, of, it's really the redemption story of Anakin Skywalker, yeah. but, you know, really connected to his son, Luke, and all that. The real story of Star Wars is how a civilization goes from basically being independent mm -hmm. worlds mm -hmm. to a leader who attains, who creates a war, 
to attain power, to get emergency powers that Jar Jar Binks says right. we're going to give him right. emergency powers. Right. And that and that actually, if you look at a post-COVID world, if you yes. look at all of the things that we're seeing right now, uh, is deeply, uh, it's deeply true and it's connected. Yeah. So th there's many reasons. I, I'd love to talk to him. Also, he was, when he created Star Wars, you know, he was a rebel yeah. in, the, in the industry because, you know, they, the studios... We're basically giving him very limited budgets to do this thing. And he said, I mean, one of the coolest things that he ever did was he said, okay, I'll take the limited budgets on this thing, but I want all the rights to the toys. And at that point, nobody, this is late 70s, there, there really were no action figures. Like we grew yeah, up yeah. with G.I. Joe and Transformers yeah. and everything else. But back then, toys in that sense, there were early G.I. Joe dolls like this. Yeah, yeah. But the idea of an action figure like this Nobody in the industry thought it was going to do anything. They thought boys will yeah. never play with these things, these little things. Yeah. That's for girls. Yeah. But he said, I'll take the rights to that. And he ended up making more money of that. So everything that he did in terms as a businessman, as a, as a, wow. as a creator and a, and a philosopher yeah. that he put into his work, I think is just really That's extraordinary. That's like looking around the corner, right? Because he knew yeah. he was probably going to capture people's imagination with his work. And then he maybe saw where toy technology was going. Yeah. And he just took the bet. It reminds me of... Uh, Jobs investing in Pixar. It, yeah, you know, it's the exact same thing. Yeah. It's the exact same thing. Do you okay? I like you brought up George Lucas. Yeah. As I understand it, he's largely inspired by Joseph Campbell and yeah. his work on the oh, hero's yeah. journey, and that's what he's codified into the original Star Wars trilogy. So when you say it's it's you know we're captivated by all the spaceships and robots and lightsabers. But what's really capturing us is this hidden architecture of storytelling, right? That it's yeah. the hero's journey that's being demonstrated on screen is that um is that so the, the first three yeah also has some of that in it maybe not the hero's journey but it definitely has this the prequels story. you're talking about the prequels. The, the prequels don't quite have the hero's journey because they're setting up the, the hero's right. journey right because they're telling you everything that happened before the the dense hero's journey right. of the of the original but it has yeah. this it has this uh arc of how society drifts from right. individualistic to collect exactly right exactly. and through emergency powers and whatnot yeah the last three did they just lose the, yes they, the mythology and that's why they suck yes because disney which is a woke company mm -hmm. which is which by the way you know putting aside the stories for a second giant corporations shouldn't own all of our dreams mm -hmm. it's very dangerous that disney as a corporation whether they had gone woke or not. Let's say mm -hmm. Disney was a pretty great corporation, mm -hmm. which I don't believe they are. Mm -hmm. But even if they were pretty great, the idea that Disney owns the entire Star Wars franchise, mm -hmm. it owns the entire Marvel universe, right. right? It owns a gajillion other verticals like that. That all of that comes out of one structure, actually kind of gets you to emergency powers and why yeah, it's bad. Yeah, yeah. That you just don't want so much of, of what makes people feel think and, and feel passion and, and feel creativity and all those things. You just don't want it coming out of one organization. That's not to say that everything they do is bad. Sure. The, the sure. last two, uh, the two Avengers movies, um, Endgame. Uh, Infinity War and Endgame, yeah. were actually excellent. They yeah, were, and, sure. and they told yeah. the, the hero's journey properly. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the last three Star Wars, unfortunately what happened was they have the original prequels that, as we said, are setting up mm -hmm. something, right? And then you have the perfect hero's journey, and that's what Star Wars did. Mm -hmm. Perfect hero's journey, regardless of whether you think the Ewoks were corny or not, mm -hmm. right? And then you take these other three movies where they just, they didn't know what they were doing. And, mm -hmm. and it was so obvious, you know, what's interesting about it from a technical perspective is that they did not, they've admitted this subsequently, and Kathleen Kennedy, who's basically running the Star Wars thing into mm -hmm. the ground, she admitted they, they basically handed the first movie to J.J. Abrams, mm -hmm. and then there was no arc. So how are you going to put out a trilogy without saying, okay, we can have three directors, let's say, but you got to hit these points in these movies so that we can get, because here's what's going to happen at the end, because yeah. that's the purpose of a trilogy, right? right? A trilogy is supposed to get yeah, you to yeah, the end. Circle. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's bring this thing right. around. But instead what they did was they handed the first one, Force Awakens, to J.J. Yeah. Then they gave the second one to Ryan Johnson, who... Uh, it's interesting philosophically. He was basically a deconstructionist. I don't think he really liked Star oh. Wars. So Luke throwing the jet, the the lightsaber over his shoulder, and then Yoda coming back and saying that the Jedi texts they're not really page turners. He really didn't like the lore of Star Wars. Right. And he mangled that thing. And then what did they do? They brought in JJ again at the end to fix it for for wow. Rise of Skywalker. Yeah. 
but it was so damaged at that point <laughs> that he basically created a two and a half hour just race to kind of give yeah. everybody everything. And that's why that movie, the more you watch that movie, the worse it gets. Yeah. Um, you know, a good movie. So did you ever see the movie Contact, for example, yes, or, or Interstellar? So Contact, yes. Contact changed my life, yeah. changed my life. Written by Carl Sagan, it's his yeah. only work of fiction. I if you, it, wrote it. oh yeah, yeah. It's, he wrote it. Um, it's his his only work of fiction, and it was Ellie Airway, who's played by Jodie Foster. Yeah. I mean, that's that's basically him. It's yeah. the, it's the spirit of Carl Sagan, right. our great thinker and science yeah. communicator. But the more you watch the movie Contact, or Interstellar is another yeah. good example. I'm just doing it in a sci fi way. Yeah. The more you watch those movies, Interstellar is particularly good at this. The more you will glean every single yeah. time, and you know that. Whatever, yes. what if you don't like sci fi? Whatever movie you love, yes. the more you watch it. You see little nuances yes. in the character. You, oh, he didn't say that then. Yeah. You know, what Star Wars has done is the more that you watch those movies, the because worse the gets. worse they get. So I'll give you one example, and then we can move on from. Although I could do Star Wars for twenty hours. Um, so, for example, one. Thing, I'll give you two examples in the last Star Wars movie that show you how they didn't know how to make a movie properly. You remember the scene? It's about uh, an hour into the first one where uh, they capture Chewbacca, and then the ship crashes mm -hmm. and you think Chewbacca is dead mm -hmm. well the first time you watch that movie you go oh my god they killed Chewbacca like yeah. I, I saw it in the movie theater right. midnight opening night and you're like holy cow they actually did that and yeah. they had just killed uh they had just killed Han Solo two movies ago yeah. like, whoa but then a minute later he's alive oh it turned out to be the other ship like yeah. that's sloppy writing yeah, yeah, and they did the same yeah. thing by the way with C-3PO they wiped his mind they said he has no memory and then two minutes later they're like ah actually his memory's back so they, they did all of these things where they didn't want to be brave. They didn't want to be brave. And I would directly connect that with Disney owning properties that they should not own at this point. George Lucas would have done the brave things appropriately. Yes. And and unfortunately, Disney, and, and I think you actually could connect this to wokeness and why they, why they are actually afraid to really say something true. Right. Because woke is not true. Right. It, woke is actually the antithesis of truth. Right. So when you have a corporation who chooses that as their substructure, they can't, they cannot create anything good. Right. And by the way, you only have to look, you don't have to take my word for it, you just have to look at Disney's books and yeah. what's going on with the parks and the fact that the Disney park at in Orlando, which they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on, closed after six months. Yeah. Because people eventually realized, boy, this is, this is a pretty crappy product. Yeah, the, the, the market test of woke has been the most encouraging thing to see. Yeah. Right, right? with the, the Bud Light The Bud Light thing, it's great. Like yeah. Consumers, and this is why we often say on the show, like, money is the most important vote you can cast, right? How you spend it, how you save it. Yep. If, you, if you're buying something, you're signaling to the market to create more of it, and if you're not buying it or selling it, you're signaling to create less. Yeah. And so it's been great to see the, the woke ideology meet the market test and fail miserably. Well, that's why the Bud Light one is so beautiful because it's like, I, I saw people when it was happening say, well, this is cancel culture. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, this is a, cancel culture is when it's this top down thing. You right. can't say this, you're taken out. Right. Cancel culture is some, you know, random guy that no one's ever heard of making a silly joke and then having a gajillion people pile on and next thing he doesn't have a job. That's yeah. cancel culture. Cancel culture is not when the average person is suddenly like, you know, Bud Light is pushing this trans nonsense. We yeah. see how this is affecting our kids. It's a societally um, dangerous concept yes. now. Like we've now seen this like unfurled into everything. Yeah. Cancel culture is not when the good person is like, you know what, there's actually 10,000 types of beers out there yeah. and I've just decided I'm not gonna drink Bud Light. Yeah. I'm not gonna go to the store and puncture every bottle of Bud Light right. and ruin the store owner's property or yes. anything like that. Right. I'm just going to do what I can with the limited ability of my life. So it's, yes. the, it's the beautiful version. So you're completely yes. right about this. We saw that with Target also. You know, mm -hmm. Target was pushing all of this, this trans clothing on children mm -hmm. that they were putting right at the top of their store. So what, what a beautiful thing. In a, in, and again, this gets us to the classically liberal thing. What a beautiful yeah. thing. You have, you have an ability to say, you know yeah. what? You know what? Yeah, I like a lot of that cheap shit they have at Target, yeah. but I'm actually going to go elsewhere and spend my dollar elsewhere. And then hopefully what you can do over time is create a situation where the market then starts correcting itself. That's, right. that, that's the hope. It doesn't always work, obviously, yes. but that's the hope. Yeah, this is, what, what does Mises say? Like in a free market, consumers are sovereign. Right? Yeah. So they are, the consumer, the collective consumers are actually deciding 
what works and what doesn't. You can't force ideologies down their throat because they just take their business elsewhere. Yeah. And by the way, that's also the beauty of capitalism. Because, yes. Because if somebody doesn't like Bud Light, and this actually happened, I don't really, I don't remember the name of it, but some conservative influencer then created a beer. I don't think it was called like Freedom Light or something mm-hmm. like that. And it's like, all right. And now if you want to spend your dollars there, or if you just want to yeah. go drink Dos Equis instead, congratulations, yes. there you go. Yes. Yeah. And I've seen, I think recently Bud Light announced like a hundred million dollar sponsorship of UFC. Right. They're, so they're trying to zigzag, right? Just... By the way, Bill Gates bought a hell of a lot of Bud Light when the, you know, because the stock really collapsed. Mm. They lost something like $2 billion in market cap. Right. Bill Gates got in on that now and... You know, he's had a lot of very strange track record with COVID and a bunch of other stuff. So God only knows what he's doing over there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Well, more reasons not to drink Bud Light. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) I like tequila anyway, so it's okay. Same here. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So George Lucas, like kind of a dream guest. He's got to be, he's older now. Oh, he's got to be, got to be late seventies, early eighties at this point. Yeah. Um, What are some of the best conversations you've had on the Ruben Room for it? And what were your big takeaways? I know, like, for me, talking on the show to a lot of smart people has just accelerated the way I think. Oh, it's my, great. My right? worldview yeah. is getting shattered and yeah. put back together all the time. So yeah. I wonder if you've had similar experiences. Oh, yeah, it's great. Well, it's also good because I, I can tell very easily, like, you're a good interviewer, you're listening, you're agen- you. your agenda is just to sit here with me and, like, see what happens. Yeah. And you know what it's like. When you're on one side of the interview, you can see when people are just like, they want to just get you somewhere or they want to get you personally or something mm-hmm. else. But when you sit with someone, whether I usually do this, obviously, on the other side mm-hmm. of the interview, but when you sit with someone and it's like, oh, like, I don't know all your political beliefs, obviously, I'm sure we have some differences and it just doesn't matter. We're trying to piece together something that's going to make sense in the world. Mm-hmm. That's the beautiful That's the beautiful thing about free speech. It's the beautiful thing about the ability of the Internet to now let guys like us do this sort of thing and everything yeah. else. I would say, I mean, the cliche version I can give you is that, you know, the amount of stuff that I've done with Jordan over the years yeah. has not only been transformative in terms of my career and everything else, um, but it's transformed me as a human being. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I spent a year and a half on tour with Jordan, about 120 shows in 20 countries. I saw him changing people's lives every day. Like, it's one thing to talk about politics, yeah. but this guy was literally, there were people everywhere we went former drug addicts who were not, no longer drug addicts, people who were in abusive relationships who had either healed it or left. People, the, the most incredible one that, that I saw with Jordan, uh, this was absolutely wild. We did a show in Dublin a couple of years ago. And, and you know, when you do these big theaters, obviously the, the entertainer, the host, whatever, doesn't walk out the main entrance mm-hmm. because you'd be mobbed. So there's always a little side entrance, usually yeah. in like a little dark alley that you sneak out. Yeah. We had bounced around a whole bunch of countries. We were, we were only in uh, in Dublin, I think, for a day. So a lot of jet lag, all that mm-hmm. stuff. But Jordan just, he does interviews all day long. He does his incredible lectures, does the Q&A after, like has just mm-hmm. worked and worked and worked. And now it's midnight. We probably started our day at 5 a.m. in another country. Like wow. it's that level of, of kind of craziness. We walk out. It was me, Jordan, the tour manager, and his wife, Tammy. We walk out into the alley. It's probably, it's probably about 1 a.m. And in this dark alley in Dublin, we see two guys that are about 30 feet away from us. And it, it appears that we couldn't tell if they were arguing or what, mm-hmm. what was happening. And it was dark. We couldn't really see. And then they start walking towards us. We didn't even have security at the time, which also tells you how different things have yeah, changed yeah, yeah. over the years because that's not the case anymore. They start walking to us. And then quickly we see, because now it's a little brighter, we see that they both have tears in their eyes. And they stop and they tell us that they were a father and son, the the younger, the son was probably about 25 years old, the father Mm -hmm. was about 60. They had had a falling out about 10 years before when the kid was Mm -hmm. 15. They had not seen each other in 10 years. They both independently had come across Jordan, read his books, showed up to that show, saw each other, and they made amends right then and there. Tears in their eyes, Jordan began crying, his uh, Tammy began crying, the tour manager began crying. I'm not that emotional. I teared up. Right. Even right now, I could tear up telling yeah. you. It was the most incredible thing. And and trust me, I saw many other stories like that. So so when you ask me, like, who in... Like, I could tell you the political people who yeah, kind of woke yeah, yeah. You know, I had great conversations with Dennis Prager, who's here, who's moved me in many ways, and, and yes. Shapiro and all the... And Thomas Sowell, which was yes. an absolutely formative one for yes. me uh, in terms of a lot of sort of more libertarian thinking. Yeah. But in terms of humanity and... Yeah. and 
what brings a thousand people to this conference to right. hopefully be the counter to the World Economic Forum. That's just one example of it. Like, and it was just, I mean, how, like, how, how, how can I tell you something yeah, better? Yeah, than yeah. That, that's, you know? almost, that's almost like yeah. the, uh, what, what are you? You know, we talk about the hero's journey kind of being the distillation of all these different hero's journeys into a meta. Yeah. It's like that's almost the meta. That, that was right? it right there, yeah. right? Like, I mean, think about that. The kid, you know, he was a kid at the time, so he hasn't seen his dad in 15 years. Yeah. He finds this book from a Canadian psychologist yeah. about putting yourself together. He starts doing it. Can you imagine yeah. what it was like? Then he looks across the way and there's his dad who, awesome who if I remember correctly, was no longer drinking, like yeah. had, had done the work himself. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. That's incredible. And yeah. then so many people, I, what the magic of Peterson. Yeah. Almost every young man I know that knows of Peterson has a similar story. It's yeah. like he helped me to a greater or lesser extent. Yeah. I'm included in this. Like yeah. I went through some dark times and I'm like, I don't know what to do. And here's this guy, and you know, you're opening for the show yeah. quite funnily. Yeah. Uh, and then he's telling me, take on as much responsibility as you can, tell the truth see how hard you can work, you know? And I'm like, okay, this sounds good. Let me give that a shot. <laughs> well, it's better than the alternative. Yeah. Right? That's what he would tell you. And it was funny, the way I always did, so I would do the openings, then Jordan does yeah. you know, an hour and a half lecture, and then we would do a Q&A at the end. And my feeling was if I could get, you know, it was funny, because at the beginning of the show, and you have to remember, Jordan, now he's this like international, you can't mm. even describe what the force of Jordan Peterson yeah. is. You really can't. I think I truly believe he is a modern prophet. If we are to believe yeah. that prophets exist, yeah. that that as he would say something like he wouldn't say this about himself, but yeah, yeah. but if the, if the spirit of God could speak through a human being, yeah. I think that's what a prophet would be, and yeah. I think that that's what this man is doing. Um, but my feeling always with the shows was people were showing up, and very early on, nobody knew what to expect. There yeah, was no, right. there, you didn't know what you were doing. He was, you were sh- he was on the ascent. Yeah. You didn't know, you were buying a ticket to this guy you yeah. had seen in YouTube lectures, yeah. but you didn't know what you were showing up to or anything. And you also, you know, a lot of it, because we do everything with our phones these days, you didn't know that, does anyone else you know like Jordan Peterson? Yeah. And could that get you in trouble and everything yeah. else? So we'd get thousands of people in, a, in an audience and I could feel it from the very beginning. Nobody, everybody was a little uneasy at right. the beginning. So I, I, from day one, I thought, Well, what my job is, is I'm going to open up and I'm just going to make these people laugh. I'm going to make silly jokes about Jordan and lobsters and a bunch of his references, get them laughing. Jordan will then will do work with them, right? And he'll get the tears and he'll, and you know, when he's speaking, you know, like you, 10,000 people in an auditorium, you will hear that pin drop. It's incredible. And then my feeling at the end was for this Q&A. We'll do some serious stuff, but then I'll also ask him, hey, you're wearing boxers or briefs and just get his response on that. Because if people walk out going, I laughed at the beginning, yeah. I got this thing, he yeah. handed me something, a yeah. gift, yeah. and then I walked out with laughter at the yeah. end, then I felt like it was like a complete night. And the yes. night, and Jordan would always say to me, and this is to the credit of Jordan, he would always, the best nights that we had mm-hmm. were, were usually when I was the funniest because mm-hmm. it allowed it to be complete for him. Mm. And, and my favorite things about the tour were the nights that I could make him laugh on stage, mm-hmm. if I could really <laughs> make him laugh. Because the audience loved it too. Yeah. When Jordan would laugh and and you know his body language would totally change and you know yeah, he'd be yeah, yeah. you know the seriousness he'd, and then cracks. you'd, you'd yeah. see the seriousness crack and then literally you know and also because he's tall and lanky yeah. I always thought there was something if he was sitting in the chair like this at the end like laughing and doing mm-hmm. all his gestures uh-huh. I thought that was a show yeah. that was a show and that's why I was it was a, it was a privilege and a joy and I, a million other adjectives yeah, yeah I man yeah, I've listened to all of them. Yeah, three times. I'm not. I'm not even an audio guy, but those lectures I listen yeah. to a lot, and it reminds me of the quote: "If you're going to tell people the truth, you better make them laugh, otherwise they'll kill you." Yeah, yeah. So Oscar you're, Wilde. Yeah, you're bringing some balance to the yeah. force in, in, in that yeah. uh, era. Of you know, there's there's career. one other funny thing on that because Jordan, if you've listened to a lot of those lectures, he's actually quite funny. Yeah. What, and, oh, but but his intention is never to be funny. Right. So like there was a line that he would do often about the, the you probably heard him talk about it, the experiment we related to rats and cocaine. Oh, yeah. And that they, yeah. the, in essence, the rats could not stop doing cocaine right. until they were Just dead. Lover. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so just Jordan Peterson in and of itself saying, was it rats or mice? I think it was mice actually yeah. uh, saying mice and cocaine, like just yeah. those two words together are funny. Yeah. So Jordan would get a laugh, but the tour manager was this guy, John. And John was a former comedian also. Yeah. And our, our running joke about Jordan the entire time was that Jordan does, you know, the death of comedy is when you when you get a laugh, you want to wait. 
you pause that out. Uh-huh. You, you let that laugh. Because yeah. also in a, in a theater, it's different than a comedy club. In a comedy club, you got like 200 people. You get a laugh. Yeah. It kind of like sits in that room. In a theater, the beauty of a theater is you could feel the laugh move around the room. Uh, Suddenly, you know, oh, those guys got it over there. Yeah. And then it takes a minute. And the next <laughs> thing you know, they're laughing over there. And then they start laughing because those, like, yeah. there was, it's a symphony. Yeah. And we would always give Jordan shit because he would, he was funny. Yeah. But his intention was never to be funny. So he would do the thing that if you were, if they, if they could teach comedy, which they can't teach, yeah. the first thing that they would tell you is if you got a laugh, let it, let it ride. Let it ride, man. <laughs> but he just, he couldn't do it. He could not do it. That's and, uh, so yeah. Funny. Not that um, he needs any tips on public speaking well, he, from he anyone. He definitely dropped some good jokes throughout that lecture. Mm-hmm. Series. Like, I can't remember what it was. Talking about the rats wrestling, right? Yeah. The rat doesn't, if the big rat doesn't let the little rat win 30% of the time. Right, occasionally. Long, ha- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So have you ever wondered about rats wrestling? Yeah. <laughs> he would always drop these kind of dry jokes. Yeah. The, point. Yeah. the other thing that I really appreciated you contributing, though, is... Towards the end, like he had obviously good nights and great nights, yeah. right? And you would sort of engage that at the end, like, ladies and gentlemen, tonight you really saw Peterson at his best. And, and by the way, I never, I never lied about that. No, no, you're always telling the truth. That's what like, yeah. the best lectures that he gave. Yeah, you would actually, come out there and be like, wow. Oh wow, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because it, it really is true. And it was, I felt it on the nights where he, he was always great. Like yeah. bad Jordan Peterson is basically right. better than anybody else. There were two or three shows. Uh, there was one show that was actually in Long Island, which was my home show and my folks and family were at, and it was absolutely pouring rain. It was an old theater there that it was dripping into the theater while people were there. Jordan wasn't feeling well. That was one of the few shows that, like, if you ask me, there were probably two or three shows out of over a hundred that were that were, I would say, subpar. But again, Jordan at his worst is yeah. basically better than anybody else. You know, it's Michael Jordan on a on a bad yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. still the best player on the court. Um, but there were some shows the Sydney Opera House show mm. that we did, which was our last international show together. It was it was magical. So I, I would always make a point of saying if, if, if I felt that they saw a particularly special show, and what that meant to me really was that I could see Jordan uh, going to the end of his knowledge on mm-hmm. that night. Yes. You know, he was very good about that. Like, you know, yes. public speakers, usually you just go to your greatest hits, right? Yeah, like yeah, you yeah. just, oh, here's the speech Three I always packs. gave and it's yeah. the same old thing. What Jordan has done, in it, and by the way, it's made me a million times better at yeah. public speaking because I'm not afraid of the unknown now. Yeah. Jordan, would, you could, I could see it. I could literally yeah. almost physically see it. He would go as far as he could with an idea. Mm-hmm. And then on any given night, he would get to the end and he would say, that, you know, he nods a couple of times, do something with his hands. That's about as far as I'm going to go with that tonight. But yeah. then what I had the privilege of seeing, and if you've now listened to these, mm-hmm. the next night he would pick it up he would have just thought about it during yeah. the day and then so he was doing basically you remember choose your own adventure yeah. books that's what he was doing yeah. as a tour no one I, I don't think any public lecturer has ever yes. done that in in modern times maybe, maybe they did it back in ancient greece yeah you, know, if you saw a socrates on back to that right, day exactly yeah actually thinking out loud yeah and I, yeah. when i interviewed him too he's actually thinking about his answer he's yeah. not just rattling off some pre-programmed response and it's just something about that authenticity right and, um, well, he made the commitment to himself a long time ago to like just stop saying things that aren't true. Right, he had to like hammer this into himself, and maybe that's what's led to his development to become such a prolific orator. Well, one of his great lines is is directly related to that when he talks about faith. Yeah. His answer is what you just said right there. His answer, Tucker Carlson asked him about how does he define God? How does mm-hmm. he define faith? And what he said was when he was in his twenties, he decided to tell the truth for truth's sake. Yeah. And he said, that's a leap of faith. There, yeah. There's no reason to believe right. that if you just tell the truth, it's right. going to put order into the world. Right. right? There's no logical reason. You tell the truth. Yeah. Jesus Christ told the truth. Didn't work out. You know, yeah. you know like yeah. you tell the truth, they're yeah. going to do awful things to you. That's how the system, unfortunately, operates. Yeah. But the, the very notion of telling the truth is better than the alternative. It doesn't mean good things are going to happen, but it's better right. than the alternative. That's a leap of faith. What a what a what a, what a freaking yeah. incredible way of looking at faith yes. for people that come from a more uh, let's say intellectual side of things mm-hmm. that live up here maybe more than they live here. Yes. What a great way to explain to them why faith is good. Like yes. I, to me, I heard him say that having done all the yes. shows with him, right. and I heard him say that years later on Tucker Carlson about two years ago, right. and I thought I can work with that. Yeah, there's a there's an intrinsic component of faith because it's unfalsifiable. Right, you're 
you're just betting. Telling it's the a truth. leap of faith. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll see what's on the other side of this. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things, such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is much more clear. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from 1,473 human trials conducted over a period of 32 years. So if you're looking to start enhancing your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a crowdfunding platform for paying medical expenses in lieu of an insurance policy. CrowdHealth recently announced that it is integrating Lightning payments with Breeze's Lightning SDK. In the United States, we spend more than twice the average amount of money on healthcare than other developed nations. Medical costs are one of the leading causes of bankruptcy in the United States, and it is not a secret that the medical system in the U.S. has many, many issues. The CrowdHealth model is based on offering an alternative to the conventional insurance policy at a cheaper price point. For a monthly membership fee of $50, CrowdHealth will negotiate medical bills to get the cheapest price possible, help locate healthcare providers, offer access to their member crowdfunding service, and more. Prior to the Breeze integration, CrowdHealth had been functioning over traditional fiat payment routes, which introduced unnecessary transaction fees and delays in settlement. By integrating Lightning payments into the CrowdHealth business model, payments between members can now be made with near zero fees and with final settlement occurring in mere seconds. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove today to sign up. The other thing that's been transformational for me is my, I've always held freedom to be my highest value. Um, I don't know why, but some of us are just born in certain ways. Uh, I guess there's a, a component of my parents too. They've always been entrepreneurial, kind of free willing people. My conception of freedom pre Peterson was me being able to do whatever I want. Yeah. You know, like as many options at my disposal as I can possibly have. But then something happened going through this journey, listening to him, reading his books, the, the realization of uh, the sanctity of truth. I'm like, well, how does truth fit into this equation? And freedom now to me, means submission, submission submission to truth. You right. actually have to submit to the truth. And what I mean by this is like, okay, we all drive on the right-hand side of the road in the U.S., right? That's taking away an option from us, right? right. right? We, we could just say, oh, let everyone be free. Drive right. on whatever side of the road you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have a bunch of car accidents and traffic and, you know, chaos, basically. Yeah. But when we submit to the truth that if we all agree to this social convention of let's all drive on the right-hand side of the road, then it creates more freedom, right? Yeah. We can actually move around much more seamlessly. Uh, so you could say the same about marriage, right? Like you, you submit to one partner to create this institution, to create a family. Like it's, you're taking away all the options of the dating yeah. pool, but it's the truth that we are best able to raise children in that institution, right? With one mother, one father, masculine, feminine. Yeah. And so it, 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 it enables a longer term freedom by sacrificing a shorter term freedom, something well, like that. Well, yeah, you're, you're basically talking about the difference of freedom to versus freedom from. Yeah. Like the, the immature way of looking at it is I want the freedom to do whatever I want. Yes. That is the end all with freedom. Yeah. I want to do whatever drugs I want. I want yes. to have whatever sex I want. Yes. I just want everything and I want to be able to do anything and no one can judge me for any of it and blah, blah, blah. Right. And that sort of makes sense. When you're young, it definitely mm -hmm. makes sense for a lot of reasons. That's one type of freedom, but but as you just described, eventually that puts you in a prison of your own making right. versus the freedom from. You want right. freedom from coercion. You want mm. freedom from an overreaching government. Yes. You want freedom from... The tyranny of your own desires, even. Well said. Yeah. That was, I was going to do something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got no, it. It's, yeah. a great, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's just very, very transparent. We'll probably go on and on about Peterson. Yeah. Guests that you had on your show that's thrown you the curveball mid-interview, took a path you did not see coming, 
Uh, I'll leave it open to you. Yeah. There's something, a surprise, a twist. The, the most famous one for sure is an interview that I did in about, I think it was uh, February of 2016 with Larry Elder, conservative mm -hmm. writer, happens to be black. That's how I describe him. Mm -hmm. I was still mostly a, a lefty. I considered myself a progressive at the time. And we got into it about systemic racism mm -hmm. and policing in America. And he turned it on me. Have, have you ever seen this video by any no, chance? It, it's been clipped up a million times. I mean, it, it's been seen probably a hundred million times one way or yes. another. And the reason it's been seen that many times is in the interview, I ask him about these things. He comes back to me with stats about police shootings and systemic racism mm -hmm. and all of these things. And instead of doing what most people do, which is then yelling at him or shutting yeah, him yeah. down or anything, I just kind of took the hit and yeah. I started listening. And what was interesting about it was we didn't live stream that one. It was live to tape. We were airing mm -hmm. it the next day. I was at a pretty big network at the time. And all when I went into the control room after, I got, I mean, I got beat up in this mm -hmm. interview. I, he was ready to fight and I wasn't ready to fight. Mm -hmm. And I go into the control room and all the producers were like, don't worry, Dave, we're going we're gonna to edit that out. And you know how you just have mm -hmm. a moment in life where you're, sometimes you don't even, you don't expect the moment and you don't even know how it happened. But I just immediately was like, no, we have to leave that in. Mm. How could we edit out the, the thing that mm. was clearly, I, I know I didn't look good, but how could, yeah. that's the thing, that's yeah. the thing. And they aired it, we aired it the next day, and I was not thrilled that we were airing it, but I was like, I have to do what's right. Mm. And then it started going viral, and then I started looking at the comments, and at first it was, ah, Ruben got destroyed, mm. and libtard, and blah, you know, and then they clip it, and it's like, black conservative destroys white libtard, all that mm. stuff. But then I started looking at the comments, and people were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Dave's reaction there. It looks like he's going to start thinking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Larry, now five years or whatever it is, seven years post that, not only is one of my best friends on this planet, but he ran for governor of California, got millions of votes in the recall against Gavin Newsom. I campaigned with him. Mm -hmm. uh, our ideas have come a lot closer together. Mm -hmm. But that one, because I listened and I was willing to hear the truth and then yeah. and then modify after that that's the one probably more than any that that well it fundamentally altered the course yeah. of my career and and my life right. actually yeah and that's so i mean was that inspired by working with peterson right to have that level of humility that was before jordan that was before jordan. that was before jordan you know what that was inspired by probably um was my my one of my heroes growing up was larry king so it's not okay. a, it's not a shock that i became an interviewer to some extent right. and larry and i had become friends yeah i was actually doing that show he had created a digital network called aura tv so the studio yes. that i was in was actually larry's studio and we would just reskin right. it so it was a room like this and then we would just you know change the walls a little bit and what i always loved about larry growing up and i, I was always sort of interested in politics but i remember being like 12 watching larry king tonight yeah. on cnn and i always thought here's this nice man who you know, he would always sit there like this, and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and who was kind of funny and pleasant and mm -hmm. didn't berate his guests and everything else. And I guess that got into me as an interviewer mm -hmm. one way or another. And I was very proud that Larry became a friend and a, I was yeah. described he was like a bonus grandfather to me. I was, <laughs> I was with him really right before he passed away. Yeah. And uh, so I guess that the spirit of that, I guess, right. got in me somehow. I watched a little bit of Larry King when I was young, but I, I mean, that takes a great deal of humility, what you did, right? To kind of take it on. Hum the sometimes it's like, it's like pure stupidity in some <laughs> respect, but I guess humility is also nice. Yeah. Well, but it's a willingness to learn. It's yeah. an openness to other ideas, especially yeah. when you're in the public eye, like the tendency is like, oh no, I need to defend myself yeah. or whatever. But um, I think it's good as an interviewer to just realize you don't know everything. Yeah. And you're, like what Peter said, like you're there to learn something. Right? Well, what would be the damn point of this otherwise, right? Exactly. Like, why why would you do this right. if you were like, well, I know everything. What do I need to sit with this schmuck for? Your totalitarian you know. perspective, right? I know everything. Whereas if you're open yeah. to learning new things, well, you're going to get hurt sometimes, hurt, you know, um, embarrassed maybe yeah. in the interview process. So that's that's cool. You did that. What are you okay? What is the mission of your show? Like, what are you hoping your audience takes away? What is the core? thesis like obviously yeah. you're you're open and exploring these ideas you're obviously learning what are you trying to deliver to your audience though in terms of vision or purpose well i'd say it's shifted certainly over the years you know what put me on the map was doing interviews like this and as i was doing that um then podcasting really exploded i was one of the first guys online that was doing long form interviews because mm -hmm. when i started everybody was doing snapchat and uh it was before TikTok, but I remember Vine, yeah, those yeah, six yeah. second videos. Yeah. Everything was getting smaller and I, I did not like it. I just simply, it wasn't what I liked. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, let me do 
the thing that I liked, which was the old school Larry King mm -hmm. style interview. So that's what I did for a long time, and that's kind of what put me on the map. What I do now more so is I do a daily show, which is direct to camera, mm -hmm. talking about the news. And I try to do it in the spirit of what we talked about with Jordan and I doing those shows, where it's there. I'm talking about serious stuff. We're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna talk about what just happened in Israel, but I'm gonna, to the best of my ability, I'm also gonna try to make you laugh somehow. And and some sometimes you can't you cannot do it. Yeah. The first few days after after uh, October seventh, it was almost impossible. The, the, on October 8th, when we went live, or I guess it was the 9th, was that Monday, um, I said to my guy, we set up a show the way we normally do. Yeah. And I said to my guys, right before we went live, I said, I have no idea what I'm going to do right now. I had no idea. Could I do the show as it was set up? Was I just going to talk? Was I going to literally talk for five minutes and then end it? Was I going to break down? I had no idea. To me, though, what I'm, what I'm trying to do when the world is a little bit more ordered and we're not dealing with just like the immediate of the unimaginable barbarity and horror is I want to communicate to my audience the ideas of what's happening in the world, what's happening in our culture and our politics, and then have them feel a little lighter after. Mm -hmm. When the show ends, it's the exact same thing I told you with the Jordan thing. When the show ends, if I if it was a funny show, mm -hmm. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I go, that was a good show. You can get your news in a million other places. You can turn on CNN and be bludgeoned with nonsense. Mm -hmm. You can listen to some other podcaster fire and brimstone screaming at you. I think what I can do is communicate a lot of it. And this is, a, this is the beautiful thing of being an interviewer too. If you take the pieces of Jordan that are good and then you take the pieces of some of the other people we mm -hmm. mentioned, Dennis Prager or Ben Shapiro or whoever it might be, you take all the pieces that, that they can offer you and then you can combine it into something and then explain something else in a new way. Mm -hmm. That's a really beautiful thing. So I think I was given a gift in a sense by having these great people to sit down with that have now allowed me to discuss extremely often painful things or complex things or societally, you know, foundationally yeah. epic existential things that we're dealing with right now. I think I can explain it to people in a good way. So my favorite thing now is not when people say actually the show is funny. It was when people say, you know, I watched the show. I feel all right after you know, I like that. I like that more because that to me is like, who's no one's watching MSNBC and being like, boy, I feel all right. After. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you're feeling like you got hit in the head with a frying pan or, or yeah. like lied to or something else. But if you feel all right after, you know, like, or I, or no, the, the, the usual thing is uh, I don't feel crazy. Uh, that's the line. And I'm always like, all right, that's something. That's yeah. something. Yeah. Is it, I mean, part and parcel of the humor, right? The humor is sort of yeah. medicinal, like you're delivering some harsh realities perhaps, but you're giving some medicinal humor to go with Even if I just show them what my actual emotion is. So we play a clip yeah. of AOC saying something that we know is a mm -hmm. lie. It's like, if I, can I, can I curse? Of course. Yeah, I mean, like if I, if I just say, fuck, <laughs> what the fuck? And, and that's all, sometimes that's all I have left. Like, yeah. you want me to analyze yeah. this idiot yeah. again? Like we've yeah. been through this, right? She's a liar. She's a demagogue. She's a buffoon. Uh, She's an actress. So sometimes uh, if we literally just, you know, I'll say to my audience, we'll come back from a clip. I'll be like, Fuck! <laughs> and then I'm like, you guys don't need me to analyze that. Yes. And we'll put that clip up right. because it's enough. I, I, the, the other thing is, you know, if you do a good show that, that is actually um, respectful of your audience. Yeah. Well, if you do a good show in the first place, you cultivate a certain type of audience. So I find a lot of times if you were to try to watch cable news, which is almost impossible to watch, yeah. they're always talking down to their audience. Yeah. It's, it's the lowest common denominator constantly. What I find with my audience, even though I'm just staring into a camera, is I know they're bright. Mm -hmm. So there are moments where I will literally say on the show, you know what I think about that. So we don't have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And that also would be sort of like when I said the thing about Jordan doing these continued mm -hmm. shows, you know, this choose your own adventure show. Because otherwise you do end up, you become a caricature of yourself. Yeah. You know, like a lot of these cable news hosts, there's a reason it's easy to parody them on SNL, which is not funny anymore. Right. But there's a reason it's easy. It's easy because they are parodying themselves in the first place. Yes. So if you if you keep a little bit of uh, thoughtfulness in what you're doing and you keep a little mystery there, yeah. then your audience will get smarter with you. Yes. And that's really cool. Like I don't mean this as a shot to him specifically because he's been nice to me over the years, but like Sean Hannity, for example, he's giving his audience red meat every night. Yeah. He is. He's a, he's a decent man, so I'm not making this about him, but like. If you took any of these, it's too easy for me to always go after CNN or MSNBC, okay. but if you just took any of these guys, you know what I think about everything. Here it is every single night. Same thing, same right, thing, right. same thing. Keep so eating the same mono, thing. Mono. 
Well, then, yeah. Mono monologues. Yeah. It's like, well, all right, that's something. It yeah. is something. You know, I think for the most part, I think he, he's doing fine work. Right. But that's just not what I wanted. But like you don't see him changing over time. Is that the difference? Your audience engages with you because you're going on an intellectual... Well, journey. you're also giving them what they want all the time. Yeah. And, you know, for example, a good version of this that I can give you is in the last uh, six or eight months, you know, mm. I'm in Florida. Ron DeSantis, during COVID, was created what he calls the Citadel of Freedom in Florida. Mm -hmm. I moved my family. I moved two businesses. I moved about two dozen people to Florida. Um, I, so I'm a huge supporter of the governor. I'm a huge supporter of Florida and mm -hmm. freedom and all those things. So I've been very vocal in my support of DeSantis mm -hmm. instead of Trump. Now, I have a huge amount of Trump supporters in my audience, and I voted for Trump last time, and I've interviewed Trump. Mm -hmm. But I have to tell people what I think is true. So even mm -hmm. in a case like that, I know I have a certain portion of my audience pissed at me right mm -hmm. now. But the best, all I can do is tell people what I think. If, yeah. if, if every day I woke up and I was like, boy, I got Trump people that like me. I got DeSantis yeah. that people yeah. like me. I better say 60% pro-Trump and 40%. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you will go crazy. Right. And what I have found consistently, and again, this can get us back to Jordan because almost everything can, if you just do what you think is right, if you say what the right. truth is, the people will find you. Yes. And, and the people who aren't ready to find you or, or aren't there yet, maybe they'll drop off. But... Yeah, it's it's a it's a moot point actually, right? Because you have to live with yourself. Yeah, and it's you're just staying true to who you are versus trying to become a caricature of yourself, as you said, which yeah. then would have you living disingenuously, not enjoying. I wouldn't even know how to keep up with it. Right, right. Like that's the problem. And the, you're going to the show is going to decline as a result. I think one thing about people, especially a marketplace of people, is they have a remarkable nose for bullshit. Yeah. So if you start fabricating a story or trying to cater to your audience, sixty forty, whatever, yeah. people are going to sniff that out. That's well, it's cool. it's one of the interesting things about we don't have to go too far into this, but um, the the Trump DeSantis thing has been really interesting to me. Not only because the the ideas that DeSantis put forward in fighting the COVID stuff were so important to my mm -hmm. life. But when, when Trump like really lies about DeSantis related to COVID, let's mm -hmm. say, or the policies or any of that stuff, it's like his all his supporters, they're not idiots. Mm -hmm. They're not idiots. They're not. I, I know them and and went to many Trump rallies mm -hmm. and everything else, but they're willing to play with that lie with mm -hmm. him. And ultimately, that can work for a little while, but it can't work over long term. So that's been one of the dangerous things I've found about what's happening now politically in America, yeah. which is... Every single, let's say, right-leaning person thought DeSantis was the best guy around something. And Trump has convinced a certain amount of people that he was the worst. Mm. That's a very dark power. Mm. It's a very dark power. And I, I don't know what you I don't know what you do with that. Yeah. Other than other than expose it. Yeah. And then let the chips fall where they may. Well again, if it's a lie, it's gonna collapse at some point. Right, so you, right. Know, you can only yes. juggle those plates for so long. Right? Peterson, again, right? You twist the fabric of reality for so long, eventually it snaps back. Yeah. So, um, well, that's great. I'm glad you yeah. encoded this into your show. I'm glad you're, hopefully, by going on this journey openly, you're encouraging more people to be authentic and critical thinking. And um, th these skills just seem priceless in the world we're in today. Yeah. <laughs> we're having uh, so yeah, many yeah. illusions sh shoved down our throat. As they say, a, a little common sense goes a long way in, in yes. a time when sense has been <laughs> basically obliterated. Yes. It ain't magic, but here we are. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Um, Dave, I really appreciate you doing this. Yeah, this was great, man. Great, great to have yeah. you. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, well, I did create locals in the midst of all this. So my, my main home is rubenreport.locals.com, and that's where people can get me without algorithmic tricks and without Mark Zuckerberg watching over us and everything else. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, we'll link to that in the show notes. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, man.